I think that we will slowly start. It's the unpleasant role of being straight after the coffee break. Uh, so, so we'll keep the door open and potentially people might be joining as we speak. Uh, great to see everyone in the room. Uh, we will spend the upcoming, like, it says 85, 85 minutes in the, in the agenda. It will depend on how much you, will, you would like to discuss and talk uh, during the session because our idea is to have a relatively brief introduction, share some ideas and general overviews over what uh, collaboration across our different organizations in the open movement looks like, uh, and then rather invite everyone in the audience to come and contribute to the, to the conversation. That's the general idea. And then, again, the length of the, of the session will depend on how much you would like to discuss. Uh, but me and Steven Weiber did like the, the put together this session. My name is Eric Luth, and I'm working for Wikimedia Sverige, the Swedish chapter of the Wikimedia movement. I'm also the national coordinator for Knowledge Rise 21, which we'll, we will mention a few more words about just in a moment. Uh, but I'm thinking I'm trying out if I can change slide myself. Does that work? Yes? No? Maybe? Yes? In the last session, I had to say next slide, please, for like, uh, I don't know, one hour. Uh, it's, it feels like I have a superpower in my hands is being able to pr press uh, um, a button. Um, but as I said, we, we are both working for Knowledge Rise 21. Uh, do you want to start to say a few words about what Knowledge Rise 21 is, Stephen? Yeah, happy to do so. So I'm Stephen Weiber. My day job, I guess, is um, Director for External Affairs at the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. And it's great that see such a sort of strong library presence here. I guess th the logic behind Knowledge Rights 21, it's a campaign supported by the Arcadia Fund, which I think many of you know is, is quite active in this field in supporting, in, in supporting advocacy, lobbying, as well as actual delivery on open projects. Um, the uh, goal behind Knowledge Rights 21 comes from the feeling that too often discussions around copyright reform tend to be a sort of big mud monster fest between big content and big tech. And far too often in these discussions, the interests of users, the interests of researchers, of educators, of teachers, of innovators, et cetera, et cetera, simply aren't heard. There's not the possibility or we're not yet as effective as we might be in bringing those voices together. And in particular, from a library organization, the feeling was that libraries far too often conform to the stereotype. They're not expected to be present in these sorts of discussions. So what can we do to actually put in place an infrastructure, to put in place the people, like Eric, like Maya, who will talk to, who, who will talk shortly, to actually bring people together to provide that organization, to really amplify those voices, to provide those channels for those experiences, those really valid, legitimate experiences of what isn't working in providing access to knowledge, and bring that to the table where policies are being made. So that's the goal behind Knowledge Rights 21. Thank that. I think that was a great pitch, and and for me that has really enabled to to start to do advocacy work in Sweden on another scale. I, I think it's like f for us the the opponents, the other side, the rights holder representatives, they have been coordinated for ages, decades, been really good at talking together, having strong networks, learning from each other, sharing learnings, sharing resources, sharing sharing pretty much everything, and users have been individual. Islands, silos, individual persons working very well individually, but you can only do so much when you are one organization or one person. But the, especially through the Knowledge Rise 21 program, we've really been able to start to build networks. We realized in, in Sweden that we have had three networks that have called themselves user networks for copyrights. One by the media organizations, one by the library organizations, and one by the cultural heritage institutions. Now. Slowly, we start also to talk together with each other, maybe having like one larger network of, of um, uh, user organizations talking about copyrights. Um, and I think that this is the kind of collaborations that we want to try to focus on during today. Uh, how can we build new bridges, new alliances between different organizations in the open movement to, to strengthen ourselves and get better at working for open legislation in the ages ahead? And, and I think j just to, to add to that and something that I should have mentioned earlier, and clearly it, it's fantastic for us to be able to work with Wikimedia Sverige, to, to work with Wikimedians in other countries. And clearly the Wikimedia movement is, is a fantastic source of experience of what works, of what doesn't work, a fantastic source of energy and, and commitment to actually making laws 
work to complement everything that the movement is trying to do. And so I think there's a very logical connection, and I know that's something that we're trying to to achieve today to understand better how we can support those partnerships and not just bring in libraries, but also make sure that, that the Wikimedia movement is fully sort of plugged in, that we're also supporting the work of the Wikimedia movement in that way. Thanks. I hope that is a clear and good enough intro on what we will be focusing on, on during the next period of time. But we have also invited a few, um, a few persons that you see on the stage to give some examples of how they have been working in different ways you know, across organizations and with, with um, like-minded organizations to, to push, for, uh, push for legislative or policy change for more openness. Uh, and the first one is Maya Drabczyk from San Francisco. I was trying the Polish, it's yeah, really that difficult. Was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to share a few words from your end on how you have been working? Yes, okay, so, so thank you, for, uh, first of all, for having me, and welcome to Poland. Dzień dobry, witamy. Okay, so Centrum Cyfrowe is, is all uh, driven, it's a small NGO, it's, it's driven by uh, user rights uh, around everything that's digital. We, we hope that through our work we, we uh, ensure or try to ensure that uh, technology is still driven by the needs of the users. And of course, then copyright, privacy questions, ethical questions around data and, and the human rights are in the center of our actions. Um, a case, so this is where I come from. Um, now the case study uh, um, that I want to briefly introduce you to, and I hope that this will show the, the value of collaboration, how relevant it is, and how much still we need to learn as the, uh, as, uh, yeah, as the third sector in our case, um, is the, 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 the very recent um, implementation of the DSM, so a copyright directive. In Poland, we are the last country in Europe <laughs> uh, going through the process. We are at the very last uh, stage of it. And um, it was very difficult for us as Centrum to, to find a niche where we can advocate exactly for all the things that Stephen and, and Eric mentioned. Because the whole discussion uh, around the directive was about royalties for actors, for filmmakers, for producers. And uh, one situation I just want to briefly uh, introduce you to was uh, a meeting at uh, um, same, that's the lower house in our, of our parliament, where this is your option as, as uh, basically all the stakeholders uh, involved and interested in the process to speak up. And the room was filled with people, like I think we were more than 100. But mostly <laughs> they were representatives of big and smaller CMOs, big tech was there, and all of them rightfully so, yes. But there were two people from NGOs. I was there and Maciej from Wikimedia Europe was there. And we were the only two voices during a five-hour session who uh, tackled upon open heritage, public domain, access to knowledge, open science, and especially that the, the, the um, implementation, like the new law, gonna change things. For, for to some extent, like in some cases, uh, for worse. And, um, and here, so that was the negative factor. And then the lobby from the CMOs and the publishers jumped in, and they were able to persuade uh, some of the, uh, the members of the parliament to introduce uh, changes in the law that for us were super harmful. And this is where the, 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 the aspect of collaboration steps in, how relevant it is to have those networks behind you, especially when you're an NGO or an individual just interested in a cause. So thanks also to our, to our work in knowledge rights and to, to the connections that we were able to make through this, through this work. We are, as, uh, as Eric is in Sweden, we are the, the coordinator of the program uh, in Poland, and we work closely with research libraries. So what we did, we activated them. And when you have universities that then write to the members of the parliament, this is a completely different message. Okay, we can sign the document, the, the, the letter together, my name can still be there, but the, what really matters is that the Jagiellonian University signed it. So the, 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 the oldest, the biggest university. And through that, we can also get to politicians and have a debate. And um, through and they activate 
connected their networks, right? So through them, we were able to uh, to generate greater impact that, than just on our own. We're just a, a two small players, simply. And I think we also need to be, uh, we just need to appreciate that, recognize it, that, that the only way forward is if you do it together. And uh, this is also something that Eric mentioned, that our opponents, they have structures. <laughs> And this is one, and they've been around for years. And they also have money. And uh, so it's, it's simply easier to operate. What we have is passion, right? So <laughs> how to balance that? Well, I still believe that, well, it's kind of passion is here. But, um, but it's, it's difficult just to, uh, on your own, to say, well, I'm, I'm acting, I'm not a lobbyist, right? I, I'm an advocate, I act on behalf of the society, and they look and, mm, okay. But then if you have this, these bigger networks behind you, it's a completely different conversation, because then you have institutions, then you have organizations, and there are networks. So, a uh, long story short, uh, we managed to it is still not a perfect law that we're, we're going to have now in Poland and we're going to kind of, uh, together with these networks now, we're going to uh, advocate further for further changes. But we managed through this intervention to bring the kind of previous um, paragraphs back. So kind of got rid of this super harmful um, sentence that they wanted to put in. So this is my story. Thanks, Maya. I really like how you kind of present it as like they have money, but we have passion. I think I will bring that myself ahead. I, I just had like may maybe one follow up question. Um, like, I mean, now I, I think Communia, like portrayed, like Communia is a, a European organization f pushing for the public domain, and, and they did like a Eurovision style uh, tracking of how the DSM directive has been, the copyright, this copyright directive that Maya mentioned has been implemented in different EU countries. And, and Poland was like called a snail, I think. It was like a big photo of a, or a, like graphic of a, of, a, of a snail. But now when the snail, like, actually crossed, almost crossed the... the, the I think we're still the snail, because it still hasn't been approved. Okay, you're, you're still, but, but when the snail... Yeah, we're, like still, after we're still missing the uh, this signature of the president, and there is still like a question mark whether he will sign it. Okay. So we might be <laughs> back to the for, parliament. Thanks for the this correction. This is like a like, telenovela. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to be kind, but then uh, <laughs> apparently too kind. But like if we imagine a situation where the snail will actually arrive past the, the, the goal line or whatever, do you, do you think that those networks that you have been building, like the new uh, collaborations between different organizations, will they survive? Is it like you did it because of this directive and then they die? Or do you think that this, it has a long lasting potential? Um, I hope it does. I hope it has, uh, because I think there is much more to do when it comes simply to help them. Uh, and by them, I mean universities, libraries, but also heritage organizations, because these are the, the kind of the stakeholders we mostly work with, and educators, to find their um, way into the digital realm. So to, f to be able to uh, fulfill, uh, fulfill their mission in the digital reali reality. And uh, there is plenty to be done in terms of regulations and uh, for us to be able to secure really like a proper um, execution of their mission uh, uh, and to be able to serve the, the users and contributors uh, in the uh, digital environment. So I hope it, it's, it's a kind of, uh, I think what is nice about challenges that they glue you together. So uh, then you have things to discuss, you have shared memories, blah, 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 there is a connection. And uh, uh, so I, I really hope and we, we're going to try to build on this. Thanks. Do you want to continue to the next, next slide? Yeah, you put it in the right order so far, at least. <laughs> Let's see if it continues that way. <laughs> That's splendid. Um, Connor, uh, Connor Benedict from Creative Commons, do you want to go ahead and uh, share a few perspectives from Creative Commons? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Eric and Stephen, for organizing and, and Maya for being here. It's nice to be amongst friends and new friends, and uh, I'm really grateful. Um, so yeah, I work for Creative Commons. I'm the Open Culture Coordinator. Um, I actually don't do a lot of direct policy work, but I support a lot of the policy work at CC with the work that I do. Um, so I'm not going to get very into the details of it, but I will give kind of an overview of the, the work that we're doing right now and the history of the policy work that CC has done and the collaborations we've had. Um, bear with me while I 
basically read off my phone. Um, so CC's origin is is very much um, from the opposition to copyright reform that happened at the turn of the last century, um, which uh, was because of the obvious lack of tools for copyright in the digital age. Um, at that time, the opponent was obvious, and since then, we formed alliances and opponents uh, uh, for new opponents and open, whether that's with IFLA or with Wikimedia. One example that uh, Eric, you brought up um, is the KR21 initiative, where we definitely work with the national coordinators. For example, in Portugal, in Netherlands, Sweden, Italy, and Bulgaria, we're very hands-on. And those local collaborations kind of empower multinational and international action on policy. The other one was the A2K coalition, which, yeah, we, we were one of the founding members together with IFLA, so that's also kind of a global access to knowledge coalition, which I'm sure many of you are, uh, are familiar with. A new initiative um, that I am more involved with that Maya and Eric and Stephen also <laughs> are working on is Terak, which is uh, towards a recommendation on open culture. We actually have a session tomorrow to dive into that a bit more, um, so I'll be happy to answer questions there more on that. But essentially, it's an initiative that aims to um, support the international community in developing an, a legal instrument enshrining the values of open culture. Um, so this builds on previous open recommendations such as the Open Educational Resources recommendation at UNESCO and the Open Science recommendation, which CC and IFLA and Wikimedia were all um, instrumental in making happen. So uh, yeah, that's kind of the, the bigger policy work that CC has been a part of and the collaboration that made a lot of that happen. Um, another area where we're getting more attention, CC in particular, because, it's because of the uncertain or ambiguous copyright question is AI, and a lot of that isn't settled, but um, it's definitely something that, uh, yeah, I think there is uh, opportunity and Wikimedia I'm sure is also looking at this what is the question of AI and how does it relate to the open movement and what are what are the what are the questions that we need to uh, work together on in order to advocate for our interests um, yeah so these are just some examples of the community-led initiatives that CC supports and that the, and that the open um, movement is also working on Thanks, Connor. You also organized this wonderful roundtable conversation in Lisbon uh, in May, I, I think, where also quite a few Wikimedians were attending to try to kind of find a roadmap ahead for the work towards an, uh, a UNESCO recommendation on open culture. You also mentioned the, the like there's so many names of different mm -hmm. uh, organizations and coalitions yeah. and everything, but would either you or Maya like to just say some words of what the Access to Knowledge Coalition is? Because I think that quite a few in this room might be unfamiliar with, uh, with this coalition. Okay, so uh, this is a global uh, initiative. Um, it's mostly about, uh, um, it's led by um, NGOs and research organizations. And the, the discussion is uh, to support uh, changes in regulations that will lead to better more open access to knowledge on different levels for, for researchers, so on a communication level, but also uh, as, uh, so both ways. As the, the keynotes in the morning, if you were in the, in the morning session, I think, uh, you could have uh, grasped it. So one thing is about um, uh, being able, as a researcher, to have access to uh, works that can support your work, and the other one, uh, the other dimension is to being able to share your work in an open, uh, in an open sense, uh, without <laughs> having to pay loads for, for publishing in an in open access format. And it's about having conversations on different levels. It's a, of course, it's not about having conversations within the circle, but using the power of the circle and the collaboration and the expertise uh, uh, from, of course, different parts of the world to uh, impact the global discussion. And one of the, the very important forums is, is WIPO, so the United Nations and Geneva. Um, so I hope this kind of... Yeah, I think that was a great, a great explanation. And just to clarify that there are more people in KR21 and, and A2K coalition than Maya, Connor, me, <laughs> and, uh, and Stephen. That's <laughs> like a whole, like uh, quite a large group, I think, of, of uh, NGOs and, yeah. and stakeholders uh, active in, 
in both of them and like talking to to the core of 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 this uh, like um, of the theme of this session i i think like at least in wipo the there was some successes due to the fact that we have built this kind of coalition or collaboration across different stakeholders so it was a very like quite a small step maybe for humanity but a big step for uh, for, for us in that the the eu the EU group in WIPO, like in, in UN agencies, typically they, they, they group the nego negotiations into different like geographical um, uh, groups, and then those groups speak on behalf of, of the members in the in the in the large like in the in the large hall. And uh, the EU group finally agreed to some steps ahead to push for more flexibility, not in the international legal framework, but in the recommendations that. Not, well, it was as yeah, it was quite a small step, but it was like felt like we actually had a one win. Not only failures and and catastrophes, but actually we do good things sometimes as well. Do you want to add something more, Connor? I, I was just going to say that it that uh, it is a very large coalition, HUK, of many many different kinds of organizations that are really really global, and that's the kind of uh, broad approach that works when the subject is quite specific. So. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's great. Good, good, good to mention as well. We are, we are more people. It's not <laughs> just the panel here. Um, should we pass the microphone to to David uh, from uh, Fundación <laughs> Connector in right. Colombia uh, to share a few South American um, examples? Great. Hola. Um, my name is uh, David. Um, I am part from an uh, NGO from Colombia. Uh, um, we are looking for uh, access to the information from Colombia, right? It's, that's our, our mission. We are librarians, archivists, and museologists. And uh, we want to have a um, local perspective. Let's quote here a uh, feminist Donna Haraway and the situated knowledge, like, right? tell uh, our own story. And right now I'm very proud to say that right now we are uh, part of the same country with the Wikimedia of the Year, a person who uh, push uh, forward the, the Wikipedia, the Wayu language uh, Wikipedia. So it's like, I'm, I'm going to talk about create new language or, or speak this uh, language in, in this particular context that it's copyright. So. We are trying to uh, be part of the copyright law since 2011. So we were following the law because the first time uh, one politician said, if you are a pirate, be careful. And many people believe that they were pirates. So we took that because actually in that definition, libraries were pirates. So And this is a big problem for us as society. If the libraries who want to share knowledge are treated as criminals, right? So we started this um, process. Uh, we uh, need to start to create a, a community to understand what we are doing in this context that is the, the copyright, right? And for us, it was very strange that we were uh, treated as exceptions. So it's kind of strange that we are asking exceptions and limitations on copyright uh, if we are uh, a fundamental part of, of the system. It was kind of strange. Um, and I want to quote something that actually I think came from Communia. Um, says that the public domain is the norm, the copyright is deceptions. Because if we think in the history that libraries hold, the copyright is a tiny fraction of, of what we, we have, right? So uh, the problem for us as librarians is that uh, we didn't speak the legal language. Uh, Italo Calvino says this is the anti-language. Someone who speaks a lot and you don't understand anything about that, right? This is the anti-language. So we create our own anti-language as librarians. <laughs> And uh, we uh, started to talk from the library uh, side to, uh, about copyright. And if you want all the details, please uh, take a look in, uh, to the Let's Connect channel. Uh, the video is called Reform Plus Advocacy with Wikimedia Colombia and Wikimedia Italy. So they, you will have all the details about this experience. Uh, what we did is that uh, in Connector, we are Wikipedians. Right, so we are like librarian, librarians and Wikipedists, 
Wikimedians, so we started to create information to explain the copyright law in a very useful way. So it's because we had many different uh, projects. We create images on common, so we, we uh, wrote the Wikipedia article about this law uh, in a very easy way, in, well, in the encyclopedia language, no? So we try to explain to, to more people, and it's because we want to everybody to explain the, the story and not from Bogota. There is a, a saying in, in Argentina that says that God is everywhere, but the office is in Buenos Aires. <laughs> so something like that happened in Colombia. The office God is in Bogota, in the capital. So uh, we try to bring the people from all around the world. And what we did, uh, campaigns, and we, we just bring the, the open movement and something that is very local. I mean, from here, if you want to cooperate, to distribute information, to share, to, uh, it's what we try to do. It's what we are living right now. So we say, like, use this logo, use hashtag librarians to the Senate. It, it, it means we as librarians want to go to, to the Congress. But we, we were careful because if we say Congress, maybe they think that it's a Congress, like this event. So no, 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 the Senate. You know, we, we want to, to, to change the law. We did it in a very clear and simple um, and plain language. And we asked to friends, like, uh, it's because we are part of the Wikimedia movement, uh, uh, the president of Wikimedia Colombia, to talk on the Senate. Then we asked to the president of the Libraries Association, but we distribute, okay, if Wikimedia Colombia asks for this, the Library Association is going to ask for these other topics. So we don't have a round of 10 um, uh, um, comments about, about uh, what we want, and all are the same, but we distribute the work. And um, in s something very strange that happened is that for some minutes, uh, in, in institutional accounts from the libraries, the people were uh, print, uh, printing uh, messages like we want a new copyright law, uh, libraries want new copyright laws, and they publish it in official uh, um, accounts, in Twitter, in, in Instagram, or that kind of things, for some minutes. Then they took it down because someone could lost the job because of that. But that was the level of implication. And people from all around Colombia were using this hashtag something on their social networks. Just that. Thanks, David. I think that's really interesting to hear. And I'm always amazed, like following from the outside, the amount of organizations and people in Colombia that are really pushing for kind of openness also as a human right, in, in a sense, like the, 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 the right to access information. But I'm just curious because you mentioned in the beginning that, that the librarians were conceived as uh, pirates. Is that something that you think that you have been able to, to, to change or are you still like working in a, like in a um, hostile like, environment? No, well, I think when you explain clearly the law, there are some points that the people start um, thinking, oh, but maybe here is something that I cannot say louder, you know, because, because so in those points, it's like, okay, let's try to find what is the solution. Maybe it's because we, we cannot say, like, this person in this library is doing something that is not uh, good for the copyright. Maybe the good thing to do is to change the law because here we have the incompatibility be between the social, cultural dynamics and the law. So it's like who needs to be changed. Right now, I think the copyright law should be changed, not the dynamics, but well, you, you have a lot of actors and probably here we have more examples about how difficult that can be. Yeah, it's unfortunately quite difficult to get the corporate laws we would like to have. No, um, thanks for, for for your perspectives, and I, I think we have had third really three really interesting perspectives on like co collaborating with uh, Wikim like outside uh, actors collaborating with Wikimedians or open open movements. Then Lara from Wikimedia Deutschland has maybe done a bit the other way around, like being uh, you know working for Wikimedia Deutschland, but like building alliances with with um, other organizations. Do you want to present your work? 
Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm on this panel rather spontaneously, so I didn't really have a chance to, to prepare many things. Um, but so, um, yes, as Eric mentioned, I work for Wikimedia Deutschland, and I'm the project manager and co-coordinator of an alliance that Wikimedia Deutschland um, started with other organizations around three years ago. Um, we call ourselves the F5 Alliance, and uh, I think some of you might get the reference with the F5 button on the keyboard. That's the, the refresh um, button. And so our general mission is to refresh um, German digital politics, which is a very ambitious mission, I guess. But we're doing our very best every day. And um, so the other organizations in the Alliance it's our friends from the Open Knowledge Foundation that everybody knows, of course. But also, um, we go beyond the classic open um, knowledge uh, movement, and we have the German uh, um, Association for Digital uh, Freedom Rights in there. We have Reporters Without Borders, and um, we have Algorithm Watch. And actually, uh, one of my partners from Algorithm Watch is on a train um, to Katowice right now because we're going to do our own session on our work in the Alliance on Saturday afternoon. So we would be more than happy to have you all come back for that um, if you want to learn some more about the work that we do. And so um, we definitely focus on the open aspects of um, digital policy. Currently, we are working on a new um, freedom of information law in Germany where we're expecting and desperately hoping for um, a first draft of the law to be published. I mean, the current coalition announced that it would be a prior priority for them, but so far we have not seen a draft, so it is yet to be determined um, yeah, what's going to happen there. But also, um, one aspect that the Alliance really focuses its work on is actually openness of government to work together with um, uh, digital civil society, because there have not really been any structures in the past um, where that has been possible to the same degrees that especially private sector companies have had access um, to government officials, both in the parliament as well as executive bodies. And so we're really trying to establish those structures and work together. And the experience that we've made is that the collaboration and having these um, five really um, important and great um, civil society organizations join forces has made a big impact and has really um, been a way to convince people to listen to us. And so, yeah, we, we definitely recommend joining forces and building alliances um, in order to open up government structures to having a dialogue with um, civil society. Thanks. I, I, it's really exciting to hear, and I also think it's interesting. Like at, at least in, in in Sweden, and I think in many many countries, we have been become better and better at working with libraries, with cultural heritage institutions. But like the F five alliance is also like I think it pushes a bit, you know, outside what the typical uh, the, the the typical uh, allies for our movement um, are. Like, how did you? How did you decide upon the the allies? Did you just kind of you meet each other, met each other, and then, or like, w w what was the rationale for like? Um, so I wasn't around back then, and um, I was not part of getting the process started. Um, but I actually recently asked some of the heads of our organizations what made them choose the circle, and they said that they had just already been working together here and there on, but more of like issue-based alliances. Um, the way that you have also just described already, um, and there was already a lot of mutual trust and mutual recognition from having those previous smaller um, points of interaction. And um, it just naturally came to be that way somehow. Um, yeah, and it, it came to be a really, really strong alliance. Um, we work together really greatly and it's super tight-knit as well. Like We meet every week and we just, continue and continue and continue. So it's not just we wait for a topic to pop up. 
but um, uh, we just keep the conversation going and we always find something to do, of course, as you probably all do. But yeah, it's, it's proven to be super helpful for everybody's work. It's so nice to hear. I, I, I often feel like alliances are so obvious when you have them, but like it was hard to conceive of them before beforehand. So it's great to hear examples of how people have, like how different Wikimedians and Wikimedia chapters and organizations have sometimes, you know, gone a bit outside of the, on the, of the typical comfort zone to find new alliances. Do you have any reflections, Stephen? Stand next to the microphone, that makes life easier. I, I think I'm kind of said this before in a conference in, in Poland, but I think this sense of this need for a Copernican shift, a Copernican shift, so rather than looking at the sun rotating around the earth, we see the earth rotating around the sun by just flipping things around. I think, I don't know, the conversation, so David talking about why the hell is what we're seen doing seen as being an exception? I think we talked, and we have one of the keynote speakers from the morning session with us, I think, who, again, that focus on why the hell is the research sector seen as being a way of feeding the scholarly publishing industry and actually trying to change some of those perceptions, some of those attitudes within government. And I think that's probably one of the things that does bring together actors in the first place because we actually just need to reshape, we need to change the framing of a lot of these policy discussions, and we have that. In, in common. I think also a point being made about actually these collaborations can be helpful for um, changing attitudes within our different sectors about seeing ourselves in different ways, seeing ourselves as policy actors. And I think we'll, we'll get on to some of the other points I had down in, in, in some of the, the slides coming up about how partnerships can connect the national with the local, how they can connect different approaches, how they can connect um, policy people, how they can connect passion with technical knowledge and so on. So some of these ideas coming out already, but I know we're going to be digging into those in part two. <laughs> yeah, and I'm thinking maybe we're approaching part two. Yeah, Is that, uh, I don't have all the we're, slides in my head, on, but yes, we're on we... part two. Now, our, <laughs> so that's okay. <laughs> so our idea is that we, we are using a Menti, uh, do you say a Menti? Uh, for the purposes of this, call it Menti. <laughs> okay, we, we're, we're using a Menti. Uh, we will ask a few questions uh, and I think that they might appear on the, on the screen. I'm asking the technical uh, one experts. Of them. Yep. <laughs> um, and hopefully we can also, also have some nice reflections on the things being mentioned. So it's more like an idea of having an open conversation and talking with each other and trying to figure out like how can we, all of us in this room, become even better at building alliances for pro-open uh, legislative reform. And, and I think obviously the idea with Menti either put your hands up or type whatever you feel most comfortable with. I know that people have different preferences, so we cater for everything. Some might also be like me with constantly dead uh, like cell phones and everything. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, sort it out. And if, if people want to raise your hands, go ahead instead. So question, oh, so I'm going the wrong way now. So first, so what you will see is, so the first question is going to be, where is the law holding back the work of Wikimedians? And we're about to go to the uglier slide, which is this one. <laughs> and so you'll just about hopefully be able to see at the top. Um, I can. Does anyone want me to go back to the QR code so you can access the link directly through that? Yep. So that should take you straight to the survey if I did it right. But then we'll ask our panelists to start off with a few ideas. Okay, I'm going to go through to the question. Once you've taken the photo, oh. <laughs> so that yeah, the question was so where is in your experience where is the law as it currently stands holding back the work of Wikimedians? Any takers on the panel? I'm not going to dive into it, but uh, as far as I know, Wikimedia is not allowed to be an observer in Weibo. Maybe they are? <laughs> I'm sure that holding it in Taiwan next year is really going to help with this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, it was like a really weird moment trying to hide that we, that we were Wikimedians at, uh, at WIPO like in, during the last iteration. It, it's really, you know, a, a clear clear example of how how civil society is held back in the international conversation when 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 one country pretty much can block 
one civil society organization from from being a part. I don't know if everyone knows, but we're the the um, uh, it, China doesn't want us to be in WIPO to push for for legislative or for for policy reform. Uh, so we were a few Wikimedians at, uh, at the, their standing committee for for copyright and related rights uh, in a few occasions. Uh, but it's really hard to advocate for something when you can't tell who you are and who you're representing. Maya? Maybe on a, a slightly different note, but okay. So the, the work of Wikimedians and the beauty of it is that you can share your knowledge, but then you need to have access to knowledge. And very often, and in most of the cases, you're individuals. So you don't have to have, and very often you don't have an a academic institution behind you getting you, providing you with access to, to resources, copyrighted resources that are sadly um, behind a paywall. So how to share knowledge without access to knowledge, even if you're or not even, when you really want to do it, you know, for the sake of the society to, to really share and uh, and allow us all to grow. So I think to me, this is one of the biggest. No, I think that's uh, that's a great point. It's uh, I mean we we do some collaborations every now and then with, with international organizations that want to share their material through the Wikimedia platforms, but they don't want to have open access policies. And I always tell them that's the worst idea ever. Not for us as Wikimedians. We can come up with ways of working around like. Uh, um, fully complying with copyright but having them rewriting their own uh, reports or whatever to, so, to make sure that it's you know complying with with copyright but it's so much extra work for them um, but a few of them realize that and a few others prefer to do it in another way uh, let's see I, I see that there's a few things coming up on the screen behind me I just is there someone who, who would prefer just saying something out loud rather than uh, writing on a phone Otherwise, I'll turn around and try to read a bit of what it says on the on the screen. Can you read those? No, no, I, I cannot read those on the like. <laughs> maybe a, a few years ago, I don't know. Um, so there's a, a lot of people that are mentioning intellectual property regulations. I think that's. I mean, also in in the panel, we heard a lot of people talking about copyright, and and I think that, I mean it's it's obviously like. So much of the work that we are doing is hindered by by a lack by a lack of of flexible copyright copyright legislation. Uh, I see lack of freedom of panorama lack, is preventing us from illustrating places, uh, which is in many countries an, an issue. This uh, this only a few countries in the world where we have like a good and proper freedom of panorama legislation. I was going to say I think the the, the point about regulations aimed at big tech catch Wikipedia as collateral damage. I think this is something that we also see when it comes to repositories, so open access repositories are often seen as being the same as YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of this just comes from the fact that, and again, this comes back to some of the points being made, the idea that somehow copyright law should also be considering the interests of users and not just be about squeezing as much royalty money out of the system as possible for whoever is collecting royalty money. So I think that idea that simply we are actors <laughs> in this space is something that I think gets forgotten too often. And so I think a, a, a symptom of that is the failure to recognize. And there's some good progress. So the work that, that Wikimedia did around the Digital Single Market Directive and this explicit reference to excluding places like Wikipedia from the rules was great. But then the next set of law came along and forgot all that. <laughs> So we're not yet at a sort of recognized status for platforms like Wikipedia, Wikimedia, so. Yeah. Another one that just came to mind with regards to um, IP regulations is the lack of harmonization means that how each Wikipedia works and hosts data and hosts content is also different. I have just experienced this a few times that uh, they just can't host things the same way and you can't put the th same things on different language. Uh, Wikipedia because of the laws. Yeah, I think that's a great point, actually. And, and like I, w when we were uh, tr um, uh, reviewing the the Swedish uh, co uh, exceptions and limitations um, chapter of the co of the Swedish copyright law, I tried to say that cross border uh, sharing of knowledge is one of our largest issues. And they were like, "We don't understand what you mean. Why is this such a large issue? We we're trying to pr to to improve the legislation here in Sweden, and that's about what we can do." And then like. 
I think this is the best th advocacy thing that I've ever done. Like I shared the, 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 the Wikimedia Commons lists where they tried to, to, to map all the different pieces of legislation in the world. And they were just like amazed. They never understood that us as like a, a global movement need to try to understand every single detail of every legislation in the world to such detail in order to be able to do, to do the work that we are doing. It's really, and I suppose that Meta and the Google, it's annoying for them as well, but they have the resources that they can pay for it. But as a civil society organization, it's a and mess. I, I mean, what I've seen is that Wikipedians or Wikimedians, they, f they figure out a technical solution to the problem, but it's, it's not perfect and, and it, it doesn't solve it completely. It's just uh, a new widget. Yeah. No, that, I, that's a really important point. Um, someone in the audience want to to uh, to comment on anything like in the uh, with, with a microphone and not a phone. We've got lots of other questions as well. <laughs> yeah. So should we uh, go ahead to uh, another small question? Um, but we're, we're trying to now, now we have like identified what a few of the issues are. So like if we try to 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 look ahead instead. Um, what does good reform actually look like? In a dream world, what we, would we have by 2030? Well, um, something that is very important for, for us uh, is um, indigenous language are very important because in Colombia we have 65 different indigenous languages and uh, well, it's difficult to keep them all alive. And uh, would be great if we are able to translate to indigenous language without problems. I, I'm thinking about the copyright law, and that's what Wikimedia Colombia asked in 2018 when we had the the copyright uh, actualization. And actually, it's very interesting because here we find uh, we found. Um, uh, colonialist uh, law because it says that if you produce uh, knowledge as an indigenous person, you are directly in the public domain. But why if you want to do it the other way around, it's not possible. So it's very unfair. And um, yeah, I think that all parts are invited, uh, involved in the discussions because even uh, within the, the open movement, uh, some voices can be more here from the upper side and and well it's not a, a bad willing or something it's just that maybe well there are many gaps that we need to to break so yeah it's definitely a lot of gaps to to try to to bridge or overcome um i, I see a few responses coming up on the screen as well internal policies for governments to publish their work as public domain i i think that's a really great point by by whoever put it like there's something that some legislations open up for, and the Berne Convention definitely opens up for it, like the, the, the global copyright framework. But I mean, if we could have more official information actually being public domain, that would be something, you know, that would radically um, change. Do you want to add something? Yeah, add a little something, um, plus open data, or the government data is linked to open data, is something that we also call for, and it would be just as nice, obviously. Yeah, that, that, that would be a dream, or maybe some, not a dream, I mean, it's something that we think that we would be able to achieve. Right. <laughs> it's doable. Can I add we add, but I also repeat, because they both have been already mentioned, but I think they are super relevant in, in this context. Um, the first one is the cross-border approach. So global, super challenging, but but at least to try, at least to in certain areas, like because otherwise it doesn't really meet the needs of the stakeholders. If we are talking about academia, if we work uh, and like the the policymakers, they are supporting the uh, collaborations. If we look at funding programs, it's all about collaboration, and and then the collaboration, for example, in research, innovation is impossible because of lack of of regulations that would allow for it. So that is one thing. And the other thing, uh, just to repeat what Stephen said before, so just, just to change the approach, the point of departure, why do you build, why do you make the law? Uh, so that it really serves the, uh, the society, the public interest. And this is why you make it and not, or at least include the voices there. So uh, just have different perspectives in. But then it's also, I think, on us 
to be able to push for uh, for this shift and to have those voices included. No, that's a great point, and I, I think a lot of us, like in in Europe, learned a lot in the CDSM and the corporate and the, in the digital single market directive work because that was I felt like one of the first time where actually a lot of actors started to get together and and collaborate, and hopefully we can kind of continue those those collaborations, build on those networks. There's a few other things that are really good. I think mentioned contract override, which is uh, which is a large issue, or, or like when when um, you by law have access to something, but then platforms or whatever invalidate this uh, this this right. Um, make sure to save all those clever comments and and to keep them for we'll get the download, yeah, for posterity. Just, Amazing. Yeah. No, no, and I think that that's a particularly interesting one because there are countries that get that right. Ireland gets it right. Bulgaria gets it right. Portugal gets it right. Um, Belgium gets it right, which is interesting to say. But yeah, Belgium gets it right. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a few countries that just in general say that you can't opt out of copyright exceptions through contract, which is a great way of protecting users against shrink wrap contracts. And then I just saw also a new comment, like plenty of training so that non-lawyers can understand. Maybe we're talking about two, two difficult concepts yeah. altogether as well. But I, I think that's also really important because most of us are not lawyers, right? In, in the, the, there's, of course, a few lawyers in the Wikimedia movement, but it's a movement of passionate people that some of them are lawyers, some, most of them are not. But we really need to, I mean, we have a lot of things to say and do uh, in this. Again, it, it's something that's possible. Like Singapore has a great record of producing human readable law. <laughs> so if you look at Singaporean legislation, it's amazing. It's so easy to understand. Oh, sounds also like a dream. Yeah. Should we continue to the next question, perhaps? Um, so this is like, how, how can we as Wikimedians um, bring new collaborations together for, for the reform that we would like to have? What, what should we do to actually build the alliances needed for, for legislative reform? So th this is actually even a pair of questions. So what do Wikimedians bring to the table? And what do Wikimedians need from other partners in order to be effective? So it's, it's it, yeah, it's a twofer. I guess I could just argue that in our case, what we bring to the table at the alliance and uh, what also sets us apart a little bit from the other organizations is the community that we have behind us. And we can always argue that, okay, we're these five really strong um, organizations, plus we have this global community that also backs this and that will benefit from the things that we argue for. And I feel like that's something that um, lawmakers, I don't know, take really seriously. No, I think that's a great point, uh, and I, I think that's a point that goes for a lot of so civil society altogether. It's not just like uh, no, it's not the commercial interest. It's not a you know, it's a self interest. It's the like interest of the community. I think that's important to 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 bear in mind. I thought just just jumping on. I think one a really positive example is from Maya, in talking about bringing the university libraries on board, and that's something where. I don't know, university libraries will have big shiny names in Latin fonts, etc., outside the door. And at least with some people that we might be trying to influence and, and, and whose opinions we might want to shape, that's an area where actually sometimes for the more traditionalist <laughs> decision makers, being associated with institutions can be a powerful thing. It may work in the opposite direction with other decision makers, but and it's one of the things that reputation is a useful thing that can be brought to the table sometimes. Sure. I need to add to that. Absolutely. I think what then we can contribute, how we can contribute is add a bit of the, the, the advocacy skills. So this is what they do not have or wish not to have. So this is the, a question about the mindset. We are talking about this a lot within Knowledge Rights 21, that you also need a certain very specific set of skills to be able to do advocacy work and it doesn't I think you're, this is not one of the subjects when you're becoming at the university department, when you're becoming a librarian or an archiv archivist, and rightfully so. But I think the, this, this, the ecosystem is changing so dynamically that, um, that 
they, we are trying to push them as well, just to to speak up, to have this. Of course, they don't have to turn into advocates. That's why they have us also. Uh, but exactly, so this win-win situation, hopefully, is that they bring in the brand <laughs> to to use the the market language, and uh, we hopefully bring in a bit of skills. And together, then this this voice, there there is a message. We can build a message, but we need both. I can add something to to this. I agree with uh, Lara because uh, from from the movement, I think we can bring tools and communities, as Lara said. Uh, I'm thinking about some projects that we are doing in in Connector. Is that we are uh, putting all the the public domain artists in Wikidata, so we are making more visible uh, or or. Um, or, or, or people, or artists, or creators on, on Wikidata. And we have this law that we copy from Spain about uh, orphan works and how do you make a diligent uh, search, right? So maybe we can think about what if you use Wikidata as we are using for public domain to make this kind of search. So I think tools and communities can be. I think that's a great point as well. This like always for like orphan works and everything. They want to build like new database, new database, databases, new platforms, new nothing, but new everything. But it's like I mean, Wikidata is one good that already exists that is like, quite useful and usable for more people. I think I see several of the questions or several of the responses on the on the screen highlight like how Wikimedia actually contribute to the, to the social good that we can we can provide the positive changes that a law change would have on Wikimedia. Something I, I think that's a very strong. A very strong message sometimes that we maybe sometimes forget like if you do this change then this will happen on Wikipedia which is viewed by so many people and has a very clear social benefit. I think just adding on that as, as decision makers politicians will hear stories that it will be the end of the world if you make any sort of pro user copyright reform it's a standard standard pitch that somehow everything will end and apparently Canada is on fire because of something that happened in 2013 and, and it's a standard routine that they go through and actually showing a positive thing like this is what you can achieve is really powerful. Totally. Um, yeah, a lot, lot, lot of really good comments both from the panel and from the, uh, on, the on the screen. Um, yep. Should we try another question? So trying to maybe start some kind of uh, mapping, stakeholder analysis, just trying to see, like, do we have new creative uh, ideas of who to collaborate with? Reporters Without Borders in Germany, or uh, uh, your colleagues often mentioned the Mercedes-Benz collaboration for, for Freedom of Panorama that Wikimedia Deutschland apparently did uh, a few years back. But there's most likely um, more examples of you know, good, innovative ways of collaborating with others for good, open, le legislative reform. Who should we, yeah? So my answer is everyone. <laughs> also publishers, also the right holders, also to just to better understand their approach, because then then you can comment. I think the, the biggest challenge is that we are in silos and we are not in a conversation. And this is like a, uh, constant approach that we are in this room, they are in the other room, and there's just no way to, to find a common understanding just to have an, a chance for that because we are not talking to each other. We are just divided and, you know, we, we, we have our set of arguments, they have theirs, we, we then we talk to policy makers, they talk to policy makers, but never again in the same rooms. Uh, so I think everyone. <laughs> I might, I'm, I'm going to put Eric on the spot right now, as you've done some really interesting work with broadcasters and, and documentary filmmakers as a, as a group to work with, who are typically seen as rights holders, and so in that other room. <laughs> but I, I don't know if you can talk from the Wikimedia sphere here. No, no, for sure. I, I think that was like a surprise for both parties, actually. But we started to, because like in, in the legislative reform that's ongoing in Sweden, one of the questions that is on the table is to introduce a specific exception for parody uh, caricature and uh, and satire and that's not been like a question that we have typically pushed very hard for it's not like 
def very relevant for the Wikimedia platforms. Like, I, do, I, I don't expect that Wikipedia will be the go-to place for the funniest, best, newest uh, satires. Um, I, I would love if that happened one way or another, but I, I, I think that's, you know, quite far away. Uh, so, but it was like a, an entry point for conversations and other topics as well, because like parody is very much a user rights question. Like, you should have the right to to, to comment on something else that goes on that happens in society and then uh, share this openly um, and like we realized that that kind of connects to many other of the issues that we are doing as well so maybe we needed to push a bit harder than we had like thought on beforehand for for a parody exception but that also meant that we I, I see like uh, several people mentioned trust and I also saw it on the screen but we started to build a trust between each other and and realized that you know in some questions we're very far away from each other everyone who has been to, to the wiper conversations know that the forever ongoing debate about a broadcasting treaty is a is a topic where uh, media organizations such as public broadcasters and and the wikimedia and free knowledge movement are quite far away from each other but that's one specific question and in, in many other fields they also have a very strong user rights um, user rights perspective on things. So I, I was surprised to see how how uh, how much we could collaborate. And, and we actually did, um, uh, in, in March, we did a seminar, uh, Wikimedia Sweden, together with the Swedish television, and about like giving our views on the proposed legis legislative reform from the government. And I mean, we, we're obviously biased. I mean, we have our views on, on, uh, 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 on what it, um, what it should look like but it was a lot of people came i think it was like 100 150 people and i mean it, that's a lot in copyright in sweden like typically it's like two people coming to a to a, to a seminar and that really stressed the rights holder representative side because they had much less people coming to their end and and they 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 realized you know that there's collaboration on the other end as well they they have do they have been doing their thing for decades and no one has been on the other side and then all of a sudden there's this kind of new new kind of organizations talking with each other. So I, 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 I really like to see how that stressed the rights holders representatives to be to be honest. But I like something that I've been thinking a lot about like in that context is like when we choose our partnerships, like should we aim for the one where we are really close to each other and can kind of agree on everything? Or like because that means that you can work proactively, you can work for like change in the long run. Uh, but it might be the typical, uh, organi like the, the same organizations all over, all over again? Or should you go much more broader where you will have questions that you really disagree, disagree upon? And it might be st like straining the trust sometimes, but it might be seen as innovative and, and like <laughs> well liked by the government. That, that, that's a question that I'm kind of struggling a lot with myself. Like how, how should you balance the importance of trust and being like-minded and the kind of the shock factor of of, uh, of create of collaborating with someone. Yeah, um, I find this question quite complicated because, like what you said, Maya, it's just kind of kind of everyone. But then, building on what you were saying, essentially, I think it I think it depends on the cause. If it's just who should the open movement be working with, then it's everyone. But who should we be working with on? climate or on AI or on, you know, being able to license on, I don't know, social media, then maybe you should work with social media. I think it, I think the, the way it gets interesting is when you articulate the cause and why it's important to the open movement so that the open movement can articulate it to partners that might be random, might feel out of place, but can essentially also advocate with you. I think that's why I'm like, oh, I don't know, I guess maybe everyone, but maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, also, um, we just talked about this question in the advocacy workshop on um, day zero, and I mentioned it there, and I also mentioned it again here because I think it's so important. We just recently had a workshop as, um, together with the Alliance and a pretty high-level bureaucrat um, from, from Germany. And he said to us that he is an absolute fan of the work that we do and he thinks the alliance itself is also really important to get our voices heard in the first place. But we need to go and build more alliances and the unlikelier the alliances are, the higher it goes on the stack of the 
um, paperwork that they're going to work on. So really, make it as unlikely as possible. It goes on top of the stack. And that's just uh, really practical advice for us. And while it's uncomfortable to hear, I guess, um, it is really something to, to give some thought to and um, to consider when moving forward. I think just actually building on that, it's really interesting to see municipalities up there because that's not, and I don't know, for a library organisation, they are a logical partner because it's their money paying for libraries and if libraries are having to pay too much or can't do things, then that's an issue. I think there's something specific about copyright law that it's been sold as being technical, as being conflictual, as being difficult, as being something outside of the democratic process because it's often run by agencies, not by ministries. And so actually convincing, underlining why copyright matters in the climate space. So, for example, the work that CC is doing on open climate is really interesting because your average climate campaigner will not be thinking of copyright as an area worth investing in, but actually investing that time in saying, well, why this matters. And I, I don't know in the case of Wikimedia Deutschland, to what extent it's been possible to convince some of these other organisations, which are perhaps much more about rights to privacy and rights to identity and so on, getting them to see copyright as something that they should be interested in is, is a really interesting exercise in itself. Absolutely. I feel like for us, as long as um, the question is something that's not completely against the values of any of the organisations, we're just going to rally behind each other. And that's uh, what really also makes our work so so fruitful is that, um, yeah, we just... Um, I mean, it's, it's also really cool to be explaining why these things matter so us to the others and to see them understand it, but also see where they're coming from, where, like, obviously you always hear positions on this or that. But then when you actually... Uh, think really deeply through the reasoning behind it, it uh, opens up complete new dimensions and like it all are really, I would say 95% of the stuff fits together so well in the bigger picture. And um, I would just assume that that's the case with most of the things that we're gonna be working on. I think it's also a great way of mot motivating yourself. If you can explain to someone else why what you're doing matters, you can also explain to yourself. <laughs> Now, I also think that, like, in, in the work that we have been doing for legislative reform in Sweden, like, as, as, as I think you mentioned, Laura, like, you need to also kind of give something back with this, like, in, in a, is, it goes two ways. If I ask someone to say something on Freedom of Panorama that would be good for me, then I also need to say something that would be good for them. But we are also civil society organizations, so we need to explain to the members why we are writing the things that we are doing in the public consultations to the government. So it's really, you know, intellectual challenge and in trying to come up with what is the kind of reasoning for for like adding this to the to the public consultation or the, to the to the reply and where goes the where goes the limit of what we can say now i see siski wants to jump in and say something yeah we were told to address some elephants in the room also at wikimania so for me and i understand i'm going to use i statements i understand this is maybe a me problem but i think it touches on Stephen, what you mentioned that we've been built uh that copyright is just like really technical really complicated a difficult thing to get involved in i don't like to talk about copyright reform i know it is so important for this movement but it's boring <laughs> it's so boring <laughs> talking about copyright is not fun. And I think that's also something we can think about when we're thinking of who are some interesting partners we can start to bring into this space that also just liven it up a bit. Like the European copyright reform, one of the big campaign pieces that I think ended up making it so successful was that it came down to memes. Memes are fun. You need flexible copyright to make funny and interesting memes. And so some more funky partners you could think about, I think Wikimedia South Africa did a really wonderful job with the Knowledge uh, Rights 21 grant or from Acadia Fund, so, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. where they started working with unconventional labor organizations, including a teacher's union, an actor's union. They brought in DJs because that was a really great way to showcase like who benefits when they can access different types of media. 
it's artists, it's historians, it's not just folks in the cultural sector, but also similar to this climate change example, um, the National Institute of Health. And at the time, of course, this was just after the COVID epidemic. So it was an example that really resonated. And I think we can take that even further and think about, I don't know, sex workers are also a, a labor organization that is very creative and could be interesting to work with, obviously not for every context. Um, child's rights organizations, the Lego Foundation. There's just so many other partners that I think we've never thought about before that can really bring a little fresh, fresh movement into these kinds of conversations and also help us really broaden those alliances. Because not only will the government official, like Lara mentioned, start paying attention when you come with a really diverse coalition, but the media is also going to think, oh, maybe this is interesting and we should be paying attention. And internally, you also benefit because suddenly you're not just working with the same uh, maybe party in the government that tends to be paying attention or be your key source of information, but you can also start to have access to different information channels that maybe those new partners bring with them. I think that's a lot of really good points. Uh, I, I remember like at the opening ceremony at Wikimania in Stockholm when Michael Peter Edson who gave the keynote speech said that like he, he gave some um, some anecdotes from, from when he was working in, in Washington DC, I think. Uh, and there was like this group, like he, he, he was talking about libraries to a group of, of uh, pupils and, and they was like, oh, boring, I never go there. And then like he chit chatted in the, in the um, in the in the like uh, what do you call it in the corridors afterwards and 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 um, they they said that there's this wonderful place downtown in the city where you can go it's for free you can sit there it's quiet it's calm it's wonderful to do all the homework in uh, which obviously was the library but. The, the word library was super boring, but the place was fantastic. And I think it's maybe the bit of, a bit the same with, with copyright. Most people fall asleep when you mention the word. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good reminder that we should think in more creative ways, perhaps. And I think also just accepting that copyright is boring is a narrative. <laughs> and let, 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 let's, let's go all Foucault on this. Like that narrative has been created and that narrative does serve a certain set of interests. It is a narrative, it is not a truth. <laughs> Sorry to bring up Foucault. Let's make a uh, copyright sexy again or something. Yes. <laughs> Do we have more questions still? Uh, we've got, I think we've got, yeah, I think we've got one more. Splendid. Let's, I, let's do that one. Yeah. Then. Yeah. What makes a good partnership? It's a good good question to, to I, I think we already touched partly on, on this. Yeah. It's a good closing one, I think. I think we, we've talked about trust as a, a model to work with, which I think was, and, that, that, and, and I think that sort of came in this idea that you move from sort of talking to each other and having a shared language, but I really liked what you talked about with the F5, that you get to the stage that then automatically you, you realize that, well, we support, I don't know, by default, we support what our partner organizations are doing. And I don't know, the exception is when we don't. And so getting from, getting to that position from one where you have to individually sign in to what everyone else is doing mm -hmm. is a really positive place to be. Being able to listen. So not only share, but that you listen what the other party has to share, has to say what their, his or her, their goals are. And then the beauty of compromise, <laughs> very hard but then where the line goes, right? So also to understand your own strategy and your goals, that where is your, um, where is your kind of the, the final step for you that you, want, you don't want to cross and when is the meeting point? But I think the listening be, bit is, is super relevant because we just tend to preach. <laughs> That's a bad word, but you know, just, we, we keep saying our, our things, blah, blah, blah. They're, of course, super relevant to us, but I think it has to be a meeting. Yeah, they, they, they fill gaps. I think that's something that we like discussed also a bit, like how can we, how can we make sure that we have like a coalition that, that brings, what, what, what do you say, like to the, to the top of the table of the, of the, of the bureaucrats? Like, I think that's a great way of formulating it, actually. Um, I think a, a, an interesting angle in this is actually, when we talk about partnerships, we're talking about partnerships between organizations, but 
the people who are members and who are doing the work are actually often the same. <laughs> and so the idea of a, a I'm talking about my organisation, like a, an IFLA, Libraries, Wikimedia partnership, it's, almost, it, it's insane because actually there's a lot of people who are librarians and Wikimedians and who unify that in what they do and are motivated by the same things. So, I don't know, and, and I think ha having that shared community and, and it's almost, I don't know, it's an exception that we don't have partnerships as strongly as we might at the national or the European or the global level because actually we're serving the same community. But I, I think it's also really strong to, I, I work a lot with librarians and, and uh, museum staff, like because they, they might not always be the most knowledgeable about what the corporate legislation looks like or what the frameworks look like, but they have all the practical examples of when it doesn't work. And, and this is, you know, when I come to, to, a, to a civil servant or when I come to the legislator and say, these are the practical issues that are caused by the legislation in the way that it looks, then I notice also that the politicians, the civil servants, the legi legislators start to listen as well. So it's like having this kind of back and forth between the theoretical or the legal and the, and the practical level, I think that's, that's really, really strong as well. So to have like partners that come with different, not just perspectives on like different policy topics, but maybe also like at different levels within the same topic. I think just building on that, and I know it's one of the tasks that I have to working on advocacy issues for libraries is that a lot, of, a lot of librarians are having really bad days because copyright doesn't let them do what they'd like to do or they're researchers who are having really bad days because copyright is wrong or other aspects of information law are wrong. And what you need to do is get from this being a bad day to this being a fantastic war story. <laughs> I don't know, how can you turn your bad day into evidence and, and just changing that mindset and, and bringing in the mindset of the advocacy organisations that this is actually, this is within a context and this is a symptom of why things are not as they should be right now and using that to change things is really important and not just sort of keeping it in, which again, referring back to the stereotypical librarian, there's the temptation to you keep it in, you don't make a noise, you work within the system, actually turning that round and like I don't know, doing the popcorn, like going from like the little hard shell to the big piece of popcorn is kind of necessary. There's a lot of good responses coming to uh, coming on this on the screen. I think maybe we touched on uh, on uh, many of them. Um, I think like many of them also boils down to trust again. Yeah. Like you need to be able to trust each other. And I think hopefully some of the examples shared here are useful. But I think what we'll do is work out how to we'll type these up and add them to the. I think I'd probably add them to the slide pack. I think that's probably the easiest way to share it and make it open. Definitely, I, I feel like the oxygen level is kind of slowly yeah, no, disappearing so in this room. Uh, so am I, I the only one? Do you want do you want to say something, Laura? Yeah, I was just going to say it would be super great um, if you could maybe type them up by Saturday. And I welcome you all to join because that's exactly the kind of stuff that we want to talk about in our session. So if you have any further uh, thoughts on this or also experiences that you would like to share, it would be really great to have you around for that. <laughs> we, we can probably leave this open if people want to add in things. I think that's possible. I'm still learning my way around Mentimeters. <laughs> Any other f last comments or, or thoughts? Closing yeah, words or like comments on this? No, if, if you have any closing words, if you want to have any... Uh... Yeah, then I'll do the same as, as Laura. Tomorrow we have a session on Terok, as I mentioned, this, the, this towards a recommendation on open culture, um, where Maya and I will again be on a panel. <laughs> um, but we'll also do a bit of a workshop looking uh, to find examples and resources from the wiki universe of the benefits of open culture. So come check that out tomorrow afternoon. No, thank you very much for having me here. I'm happy to share. If we, we can talk later or through internet. So. Thanks. Do you want to say anything, Maya? You're happy. You're, you, don't, you, want, you don't need to, no pressure. <laughs> and I know always things to share, but I think just to stress again, what this community has, what is amazing, is exactly the, the examples, uh, stories, evidence, 
And uh, like as as we say, copyright is tricky to us, to librarians. It is also tricky to policymakers. So it's it's harder to uh, to be successful in a conversation with a with a member of the parliament, being for, from the European perspective, being in Brussels or in Warsaw, uh, and talk about limitations and exceptions. But if I go and I say, hey. I know this researcher, he had to fly to China to be able to watch uh, a, a movie because there is no distribution and it's impossible to have it shared. Then think about the money, think about the time, blah, blah, blah. That's a completely different conversation. So I think the uh, one of our goals as a community, and I think this, is, this could really be a case for uh, Wikimedians, is just to gather this evidence, to gather those stories that we can then jointly share. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point. Uh, that, that often is much more impactful to share the story than to share the, the boring words. Um, do you want to advertise the, the, the website and the newsletter, Stephen? Uh, yes, I, I can. The, the necessary is on the screen <laughs> in order not to keep you so long. So um, again, Knowledge Rights 21, the, key function is to provide that support, provide tools that support in, in advocating for um, reform of information laws, of knowledge laws. Hopefully the um, QR code works. Take a look at the website. You should have a pop-up that encourages you to join a um, to join a newsletter. I think certainly in the what we'll be looking forward to in September is some work on um, mobilising Italian researchers to be actors in pushing for reform and a bit of a look ahead to some of the issues on the table in Europe in the coming mandate so please do take a look but thank you very much for your participation and yep we've reached the end of the presentation <laughs>